thank you so much, Euphemia, for meeting with me today to have a chat and uh, talk about your amazing book, Slow Pleasure. Such a pleasure to meet you. I'm so excited to be in touch and hear all of our already crossovers. Yes, pleasure is absolutely one of my favorite topics to talk about. And you are the perfect person to talk to about it. Um, just, I have to say, just reading your book, the way you've crafted everything, it's just such an amazing journey, even just going through mm. the book. Mm. So I suppose we should start off with the concept of, um, of what pleasure is. Mm. How would you define it? Mm. That's something actually, when I was writing the book, I was like, huh, I'm going to have to define this because of course there's so many different types of pleasure. Um, and often people think of pleasure as sexual pleasure, uh, but really there's just so many types. Um, and the way that I described it in the book is that it is a felt sense of lasting enjoyment. And that can be fleeting, but it can be felt. Um, so it's, it's like the way that the kind of arc that I explore in the book is that one needs to be aware of what is happening in themselves in the moment. So a sense of embodiment, um, to be aware of the impact of an, a moment on you and then how you can be even more deeply aware of that, like savoring that feeling when you realize that it feels good. Uh, and that is how I would describe pleasure is a felt sense of savoring something that you notice feels good in the moment. Wow, that's that's so amazing. And the um, the concept of savoring really kind of says it all because it is kind of just like a mm, just kind of a tasty moment. Mm -hmm. And so so when you're feeling that sense, is that something that's like, is it emotional? Is it just like, is it intellectual? How do you feel it? Mm, I love that question a lot because this is something I think about. I'm trained in somatics, which is a word that also gets embodiment and somatics are two words that kind of have become a little buzz jargony words. And everyone's like, what the hell does that mean? Um, but in my training, the idea of somatics is a sense of the whole. Mm -hmm. So often people think of somatics as the body because it's, it's the last thing that we have prioritized in society. But really, it's just trying to uh, bring equity to the body to sit alongside the mind and the uh, feelings and spirit and landscape and whatever else influences you as a person. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say that pleasure can be felt in any of those ways. It can be felt mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, through the landscape and connection to others and other beings. Um, and so it really depends, but the, the idea of somatics and the idea of the way that I pr ap approach pleasure is from a somatic perspective, that it's all of those things at once or potentially separately. Wow. So, so it's like you're tapping. So the pleasure is part of your whole being. Yeah. And you're just really appreciating that as part of, as being a whole person. Exactly. Or it could be a very specific moment where it's, it's a fleeting moment of one sense, like a taste or a smell or a sound or a, a touch. You know, it could be very small and profound or it could be big and lasting and permeating. So I think there's, of course, many different combinations of how that pleasure can be felt and experienced, but there is such a range. And that's why the byline of my book is explore your pleasure spectrum because there are so many ways that we can feel pleasure that is very intimately our own experience moment to moment. Yes. Yeah, so there's um, very much that, that personal aspect of it. Um, I, there was, a, there's a line in the book and, and I, I'm not going to quote it, it exactly right, but you talk about taking small bites of pleasure versus mm -hmm. having orgies of pleasure. <laughs> uh -huh. And, and I think that's, 
so interesting because it does feel like you kind of have to choose between, um, you know, being uh, like, I guess, frugal and um, joyless or mm. just going nuts and, and indulging in your pleasure. Mm. So, do, so what does it mean to just kind of um, like, like, why do you think that we have to, when we go into the pleasure mindset, it has to be an orgy versus a small bite? Mm. Mm. Gosh, you are really going in for the good questions. You're like, let's get to the <laughs> essence of this. I'm like, okay, Toya, let's do this. <laughs> Sorry, I should have warned you. <laughs> no, I love your style. I am all about depth. So let's do this. Um, but gosh, that is a good, beautiful, huge question that I think has m much to do with the society that we've inherited and the beliefs that we've inherited and the structures that we've inherited and how they shape our perceptions of pleasure. And there are many, many different factors to that, be that shame, be that guilt, be that the sense of work first, be that the sense of mind first. And so we see that we prioritize everything else and then we deserve pleasure and that it's an indulgence or it's only hedonism or that pleasure is something that is frivolous rather than essential to our health and our well-being and also just for the sake of itself that it doesn't have to have a reason to be felt. Uh, and all of those things, I think, shape our beliefs that it is something that we delay. So it's delayed gratification rather than small sips of it throughout our day, throughout our life, in our body, moment to moment. Um, and it's it's a mindfuck, I think. There's There's a lot of relearning and remembering I often talk about how pleasure is not about learning anything new it's mm -hmm. stopping pausing listening and remembering because we we have this we know this and it is shaped out of us it's socialized out of us as we grow up in a society that doesn't inherently prioritize and celebrate pleasure in all its forms Yes, that's, that's an incredible answer. And, um, and it kind of leads into what I wanted to ask you about. Um, you know, you talk about a pleasure based culture. Mm. And I find that to be a really exciting idea that just by, you know, um, harnessing my individual pleasure that I'm contributing to pleasure mm. as a culture overall. So what does a pleasure-based culture look like? Mm, that is for our hope and an imagination to keep feeding, I think. Yeah. And the more that we meet together collectively and in groups to keep creating that in the moment and keep imagining the possibilities, the more of a reality it becomes. Um, but I think that a lot of people have internalized beliefs that whatever their challenges are around pleasure, it's their personal fault or it's their personal challenge. And that they're because we don't speak about our challenges as much, people believe that, it, oh, my gosh, it's just me. I'm too much or I'm too little. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, of course, that is a structure of capitalism, that is a structure of individualization, of colonialism, of so many of the structural and institutional challenges that we face collectively. And as I talk about in the book, first and foremost, I say we are live in a crisis of pace and disconnection. Anything, any challenges you have around pleasure is not only yours, it is ours. Mm. And so I think that a lot of people feel as though, oh, I'm powerless and then that feeds into a belief that, oh, if I'm claiming my pleasure, then it's just for me. But really, whenever we claim pleasure, whenever we prioritize pleasure, when we allow ourselves to be witnessed in pleasure, we are building and contributing to a pleasure-centered society. And that is revolutionary. And we are powerful in being able to reshape that. Absolutely. 
And um, and I like that idea. Um, you know, a lot of times culture tells us that we have to think of others before ourselves, but um, mm-hmm. this is kind of taking that back and saying, think of yourself and then you are better for others. So um, yeah, it's it's such a, um, a, a simple tweak, but um, it's a way to make people, I guess, more whole. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think it feeds in and there's a current that feeds all ways we are each nodes in a greater system and that we're, we have come to believe that we are individuals. And I think, of course, even the pandemic, for example, has really highlighted the fact that we are not. We commun- Individual care is community care, community care is individual care. And I believe that very much the same as pleasure is that we need to listen to ourselves and have a connection, a nourishing connection and trust with our own bodies and our own pleasure um, for the sake of ourselves, but also for the sake of the collective and that they aren't, they aren't interchangeable. They are the same. Yes, absolutely. Because I find that it, it, even if people are lucky enough to not have been directly impacted by the pandemic, they still feel the mood, the collective mm-hmm. mood that mm. is weighing down on them. So, um, yeah, so it does affect us, even if we are not aware of it. Truly. So that's that's great. I was going to ask you about how you felt um, pleasure during the pandemic, um, how we can kind of tap into that a bit more. Mm. Yeah, I think that I I really struggle with the rhetoric around like spicing up your sex life and the idea of, oh, we should be having sex this amount of times because it becomes really arbitrary and people be like, oh, and get into that, that same thinking of I'm too much, I'm too little, I'm not enough, I'm mismatched. Um, and so I... I really move away from prescriptive ways of saying what pleasure can look like, particularly in a pandemic when so many of us have a much lower capacity, because when we have a lower capacity, we have uh, more distance from a sense of aliveness. And in essence, I think that pleasure is a felt sense of aliveness. That's in my work. I am a commitment to nourishing connection and aliveness for all beings. And that's the, re- that's the groundwater, that's the wellspring underneath why I do this work. Mm-hmm. And so in a collective challenge like the pandemic, I think that it's, it's complicated because pleasure resources us but also we need to have some sense of capacity and a sense of aliveness to be able to feel it. And when we're lacking support and resources to have that sense of aliveness, pleasure can feel really distant. So I I think that that could be a whole podcast in itself of, (laughs) of pleasure in an lowered a moment of lower capacity either individually or collectively um but yeah it builds our capacity but we also have to have capacity to build it yes i i I totally agree with that and i do find that with a lot of the clients i work with that yes they want pleasure but they have no capacity they don't have that aliveness Mm. to kind of recognize it or even figure out what it is that they want so it is kind of like a um it's almost like a negative feedback loop you know Mm. where you need it um the the less you're able to find it so um, totally that's why small 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 titrate of like really resourcing yourself with small moments of pleasure and seeing it beyond that as you were talking about before like that big idea of pleasure that's why I think it's so important to integrate it into our days, our moments, and see that it's a slow build rather than just an on and off. So I talk about the idea of a pleasure dial as something that we have lots of choices for pleasure in moment to moment when we stop and listen. And it's also building our capacity to turn that into a spiral and have more and more pleasure. 
and that it's we often think about pleasure as a switch where it's either off or it's on it's either i'm desexualized and i'm completely detached from my body or i'm expected to just turn that switch on and be aroused ready to go wanting to have sex and it's completely unrealistic for most people most people's bodies and arousal and connection to their pleasure doesn't work like that yeah yes but somehow we, we expect it to you know even <laughs> yeah. without thinking about it so um also in the book you talk about the idea of having a pleasure practice mm -hmm. and so that's the idea of what you were saying of doing the small mm. builds every day now you have quite a lot of activities that people can do throughout the book to build a, a pleasure practice. Mm -hmm. Can you um, talk a bit about those and, um, you know, what, how they build pleasure for people? Yeah, I, um, I actually have the book here. It's one of the few copies in existence right now. Ooh. But I'll just, it's, I oh, it's so am in love with it. It's uh, got the embossed font and it's, yes, it's, and it's, all it's so beautiful. Yes. Um, but the purpose, the way that it was designed and the way that I um, wrote it was so that it's something that you can dip in and out of. Because I know that books are not a media that everyone feels able to engage with. And so the idea is that I, after every subsection, I put a reflection question or a practice so that you can read it, you can think it, and then you can ground it in your body or in the moment or in your feelings and your thoughts. And so the idea is to, to literally do that titration throughout the book of like a small practice and a pause and coming back to, or dog earing the page and coming back to it when you feel like you have the capacity and space to do it. And that was really important to me to not write a book that was purely cerebral or intellectual about pleasure because that is helpful but it doesn't really speak to the whole experience of pleasure so I basically wrote it so that you could open to any page and read a subsection of course it makes a greater grander sense when you read it start to finish but it also can stand alone in sections or subsections and just be like oh okay I'm going to go to this page and for example here's a page about seasons and cycles and then there's reflection questions like what season are you living in this moment or more generally? How does it impact your relationship with your body? So for example, like summer, maybe there's a set more sense of aliveness or winter, maybe there's a more of a hibernation and noticing. So really bringing the information in each section into that felt experience. And I think that's how it had to be written. Well, I would agree that it does make it easy to um, dive in and out of it because I feel like the idea of adding pleasure to your life, particularly during a pandemic, it feels like a lot of work. Yes. <laughs> and sometimes um, I feel like it's easy. Society has made it easier for us to be um, to do the opposite of pleasure, which is um, Oh, I don't know which we consider the opposite of pleasure to be, to just be kind of grumpy and, um, you know, closed off and not mm. out there. Um, mm. that, that almost seems like that's easier to do than pursue pleasure. Mm. Yeah, I think that going back to that conversation around capacity is that we are all trying to build our capacity or resource ourselves in each moment with the tools that we already know how to use. And there's a constant balance between, okay, support where you're at and potentially soothe or just try to, to, to deal with what you already is and then capacity building. And I think there's been a greater rhetoric around <clears throat> um, just do whatever you want, soothe, do this, just cope with, use your coping strategies and that is enough. And yes, in some moments that is absolutely the answer and how wise we are to have created and found those coping skills. And then 
it's balanced with, okay, when we have capacity, how can we keep learning and feeling and deepening our practices so that our baseline becomes more solid? So that in moments of stress or in moments of pressure, we fall back on that baseline of what we already know and have practiced and have embodied. And so it's constantly a, a pull between those two of knowing when do I soothe and allow what already is and just cope and move through what is happening? And when can I build and grow and how do I know? So there's a little bit about that when it comes to practice, because I think that some people can have a really uh, complicated relationship with the idea of practice and doing and learning, because it can be quite puritanical in like, oh, you need to always be striving and learning and growing and building and that kind of capitalism momentum of quick, 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 quick. And it's done. There's only a, a right way and a wrong way. And it's rather, okay, how can you listen to your body to know when you can learn and grow and build for the sake of your deepest needs and wants and to really know the deep why of why you want to feel pleasure and why you want to prioritize pleasure in your life. So it's complicated and I talk about that in the pleasure practices section yeah. because it, there's there's a lot to it. Yes, and it, it is a bit of a, a journey and um, yeah, and, and it is work. What, one of the things that um, really resonated with me in the book is, um, is how you talk about contradictions. And um, early in the book, you give us permission to be contradictory individuals, mm. which, which I thought was great because I feel like, you know, like logically you're always trying to say, like justify your contradictions. Mm. But, but to me, I was like, oh, great. I have permission to be a contradiction, you know, <laughs> so I'm going to celebrate that now. Um, but And later in the book, you talk about um, how you can make space for contradictions without contracting. Mm. Can, you, can you describe a bit more about what that might look like? Mm. I am loving your questions. You are just... <laughs> <laughs> we have got many more conversations to have after this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh. mm. Mm. I'm feeling into my own body for that question like bringing it up yes from you're, the you're, depths you're absolutely um showing us how to pause before you know, <laughs> taking the next step mm. yeah There are many ways I could answer this question. And I think coming back to those structures and institutions we've inherited, there's very, in that colonial thought, there's very binary thinking. Mm -hmm. And it's either the good, the bad, the right, the wrong. And that we can often get stuck in believing that there's only one way and that we need to present ourselves to the world in a way that is predictable to be accepted and to belong, which becomes very complicated when we are incredibly multifaceted, dynamic people. And to my essence, I have had to keep peeling back my assumptions and my layers around binary thinking and binary beliefs and how to build our capacity and to keep, like we were talking about that growing and learning, how to keep building that capacity to hold complexity and nuance in ourselves and in our relationships and with the world. And that often when we uh, meet contradiction in ourselves or in others or in the world, we can retract back in to wanting to find the simplest 
or the right or the wrong and to be able to categorize things. And part of the deep, one of my many reasons why I have my own somatic practices and embodiment practices is to build that capacity to hold complexity without contracting so that I can allow the space and grace for myself to keep evolving and emerging and growing and to offer that gift to my clients and to my loved ones and to the people and strangers that I meet every day. Yeah, so you kind of provide an example of living with your complexity and um, just letting it be out there and interact with people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think one of the ways I do that is in my gender identity and expression is allowing myself to not feel as though I need to be read or understood in it, that I can just exist and I don't have to be a man or a woman or the gen the binary ways and op and options that we have been given in society mostly in a colonial era and colonial thinking around that um and the world doesn't favor it mm -hmm. or the world doesn't favor non-binary anything um but to keep building a culture like we were talking about building that society where we can collectively hold that complexity is one of my greatest hopes. All right. So you're reclaiming your space as an individual by giving yourself permission to just exist. Yeah, not even an individual, just allowing myself to unfold moment to moment and to shift and emerge. That's lovely. The, the idea of doing that is very exciting to me. And um, I suppose we should talk about some of the barriers that you've mentioned in the book about, you know, allowing yourself to evolve and emerge. Um, I think uh, shame was one that really resonated for me and um, the idea of um, how we have, uh, you know, we, we carry our own bits of shame, but then there's also collective shame mm. that, that we have as well. So I, I like this idea of like the individual and then how you fit into the collective as well. So for things like, um, for the barriers, like um, shame and trauma, um, how do we kind of, you know, tread the line between what we're taking on collectively and individually? What do you mean? Tread so, the line? Um, how they affect our um, pleasure, you know, and keep us from kind of expanding and evolving into, um, you know, a whole person. Hmm. If I understand what you're asking, I think it's really hard to pass out our individual shame and traumas from collective. And sometimes it's more easy to differentiate. Um, but I think the, the more ambiguous answer that feels more true is coming back to, it feels like a theme in our conversation of coming back to seeing that our personal experience is inextricably linked with the collective experience. Mm. And that in, in somatics, we talk about like the spheres of influence. And often we can think of ourselves as an individual and a lot of uh, more modern therapy models think of the family. So often people be like, my parents socialized me this way. But there are in each circle, there's the individual. So there are some inherent characteristics and ways we've shaped ourselves. There's family, there's community, and that may be our chosen family, that may be the communities that we have invested in. Then there's institutions, then there's structures and collective beliefs that we have. Then there is landscape, like we were talking about before. And in each of those circles, 
this actually comes from a public health model and it's also in the book because I think it's so important to contextualize all of these experiences like shame and trauma that we can have that that shame or that trauma or that barrier to pleasure can play out in any of those spheres of influence yes and can be the same trauma or the same barrier can exist in multiple of those at the same time so I don't know if that answers your question but there are many barriers to pleasure in society that end up feeding into our ways of thinking about ourselves and our bodies and our pleasure Yes, and and I suppose um, from what you're saying is that it can trickle down to us without us kind of even realizing that it's come from the different layers. Totally. I think the number one question or the underlying question in people's questions is, am I normal? Am I the only one? Am I too much? Am I too little? How do I get into my body from my head? And all of those things are those outer circles that we have internalized to believe is only us. Yes, that's, um, I really like how, you're, how you've added, a, you know, am I too much or am I too little? Because it, there's often, you know, that kind of positive thinking that they're like, you are enough all the time. And for the longest time, I was like, yes, yes, I'm enough just as I am. But then also I realized that actually, no, everyone's telling me I'm too much. Mm. So it's kind of, it's, it's nice that, you know, that there's, there's that whole spectrum of, you know, not feeling like enough and then feeling like you're too much. And at different times, you're kind of going from one extreme to the mm. other. Mm. Can deeply <laughs> relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess that, that um one of the things that you talk about in, in a lot of detail is about um, using pleasure to create boundaries. Mm -hmm. Can you um, talk a bit about that, how pleasure works with creating boundaries? Because it almost feels like, like pleasure and boundaries don't mix. <laughs> But it feels like that's what society is telling me because, you know, you kind of have like the whole Roman orgy sense of pleasure, you know, that mm -hmm. means no boundaries, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we, I joke about how as a society we're in like this adolescent stage with boundaries um, and, and we see boundaries as kind of one way where we're like, no, stay out private yeah. or like fuck off and that that helps us define and delineate where do I end and where does someone else or something else begin and that is the kind of it's absolutely necessary to work out okay what is that my container where is my container where does it finish um, and there are many people who have done beautiful work on boundaries um, and how to see that it's not just this impermeable thing. It's a filter. It's a way to create a sense of self. And it's a way to build discernment. And that we can sometimes be over porous and give too much and receive too much. Or we can be impermeable and not give anything and, not, and refuse to receive anything. Mm -hmm. And that we can, there's a spectrum of that. But the underlying idea of why I think that boundaries are important is because it's creating a sense of our container. And when we can hold ourselves in our groundedness and in our depth, we can really feel how to hold and contain and build pleasure. So any sensation, if we can create that that container to hold it, then we can be with that experience for longer and savor it longer and feel it longer and build our capacity. And that often people skip through that. They can begin a pleasure, they can build a pleasure, and then they complete the pleasure. But how to really luxuriate and allow and build and marinate in it 
that requires boundaries and that requires a sense of, oh, where are the edges of this experience? Where are the edges of myself? So I would say that that's the deeper, that is the much deeper reason for understanding our boundaries. That I talk about a little bit in the book, but it was is nearly too hard to capture in words in a book that it's more of a like an a felt experience that I take people through in coaching and workshops and courses because it it needs to be felt and experienced. Yes, yes, I can I can totally understand that. And then I guess also once you know your boundaries and you know what gives you pleasure, then that process of negotiation with another mm-hmm. person um, that would be the next kind of step of that. Mm. And then um, and you do kind of dive into that when you talk about slow sex. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, can you, can you tell us what slow sex is? I mean, it sounds, it, it, to me, um, that sounds great. It sounds like it's just sex that's like all foreplay or something, you know, it just sounds really liquid and nice, but, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what is um, slow sex in the context of pleasure? Mm, I think that it really depends on the different body chemistry between the people who are actually experiencing it. Um, But it's a sense of the same practices that we can do solo, which is pausing to listen to what we want and need in the moment and how that can feed into the communication with ourselves and whoever else is involved and to have a meandering less goal oriented way of experiencing pleasure. Mm -hmm. So there's not some escalator of like, or hierarchy of being like, it goes foreplay and then it goes this and then this and then this, and then it completes with orgasm. That's one way that sex can be had. But I think for various reasons with our crisis of pace and our acceleration through media, Uh, we and are shaping around porn. I love porn and have done many porn screenings of different varieties and representation of porn because it's literally just watching anyone have sex and be in pleasure. So that's infinite ways that can be experienced. Um, But all of those things, more mainstream porn that is shot and sequenced in very particular ways has shaped our belief that sex looks a particular way or is felt a particular way. And so slow pleasure together is saying, make space to listen to yourself, listen to each other and keep following the thread of what entices you and and intrigues you in that moment and explore how to meander with that feeling and building that container together So you can keep building those waves of pleasure and allowing it to subside and build and subside and build. And that that's not just in sex. That can be in a longer term dynamic of lovers or partners or polyamorous, non-monogamous, however that, that structure looks for you. So, but I do give very practical ways that to build that and to listen to the body of being like, am I ready? Because some ways can be rushed and a lot of people can experience pain with penetration, for example, because they believe they need to rush through a moment to be ready and available for someone else rather than actually listening to, is my body ready to receive or be penetrated? And what is it that I actually want in this moment can be a really hard questions and moment to carve out for yourself in a loaded, emotionally charged, sexually charged moment like that. Absolutely. And yeah, so that's brought us back to, you know, the connection that you can feel with people and negotiating those um, boundaries and Instead of rushing and what I find is that often people are saying that they're doing it for their partner and then mm. their partner is doing it for them and then it's mm. like okay well then <laughs> you know <laughs> how who's focusing on you so it's um yeah so so I think um it's been 
amazing talking to you mm-hmm. about all of this. And I feel like we could talk on and on about it. But just just to kind of finish things up, I was wondering if someone wanted to start a pleasure practice today, what is one thing that you would suggest for them to do? Mm. Without being too prescriptive, mm-hmm. but you know, what is one thing they could do? I would say either make a note or set a reminder on your phone for however frequent you want that reminds you to ask yourself, how could I bring more pleasure into this moment or this action or this process? Mm. And be like, what pleasure and what choices for pleasure are available to me right now. And the more that we can stop and realize what we already have available to us and what choices we have, the more attuned we can become to the possibilities in every moment and in ourselves outside sexual pleasure. And that feeds into building a greater connection to ourselves and to others and to pleasure at large. Amazing. Amazing. That's so so simple to do. I'm going to do it. I'm going to set a reminder on my phone. (laughs) Thank you so much for having a chat with us. Mm. It's it's an amazing book. And um, yeah, it'll be available at the um, Passion Fruit Shop. I know. I'm so excited for that. Such a pleasure to meet you, Toya. Thank you for your deep, thoughtful questions and your excitement about this book. <laughs> yes, I've had I've had it um, the tab open for for it for a while, waiting for it to come out. So. <laughs> I'm honored. <laughs>